Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another lecture. Today, we are covering section 7.3 in our text, and that is sampling distribution of X bar, or sample means. And if this looks a little bit familiar, it should, because it's very, very similar to the last lesson that we looked at. In fact, take a look at your essential question. How do we use the sampling distributions of X bar? Well, we're going to use these in the same ways that we use sampling distributions of sample proportions. Why complicate things? They're meant to achieve the same end. So our objectives today are going to be also the same. We want to determine the characteristics of the distribution of X bar. We want to calculate the probability of getting a certain X bar or sample mean. And we want to use a sample mean to evaluate a claim. One. So now that that's out of the way, let's go ahead and examine why do we care by looking at another hypothetical situation. Your favorite burrito spot boasts that it is the home of the one pound burrito or 16 ounces. Now you start to wonder, are their burritos really one pound? After some investigating, the company quality assurance folks say their burritos weigh 16 ounces on average and have a standard deviation of one ounce. It seems unnecessarily statistically accurate. Well, let's go ahead and examine that a little bit further. Over the course of the next two months, you decide to visit the burrito spot 31 times on random days of the week and at random times of the day, ordering the one pound burrito each time. Now you weigh each burrito before eating it and find that on average, they weighed 15.5 ounces. Is this convincing evidence that the burrito spot is lying about their one pound burritos? Now, it kind of seems that way right at the beginning, right? We have some evidence that the burritos are weighing less than what is advertised, but it's only by half an ounce. So for these 31 times, could that have just been unlucky? Well, we want to know how likely we are to get a sample of 31 burritos weighing 15.5 ounces on average if they are really supposed to weigh 16 ounces on average. So once we calculate those likelihoods, we are going to determine if something is surprising or not. If it's not surprising, then it's not strong evidence. We would have a fair, not a very low probability of something like this occurring. But if getting this sample of 15.5 ounces on average is really surprising, then that's strong evidence that the burrito spot is lying and maybe we can start some class action lawsuits against them. So before we can determine the likelihood, we need to understand characteristics of the sampling distribution of the sample mean or X bar this time, just like we did with sample proportions. The good thing is we're going to approach it in the same way and the conditions that we have to satisfy for all of these characteristics to be met are almost the same. We start off with the shape. Now we know that sampling distributions tend to be normal and this is going to be the same for sample means. The sampling distribution is going to be normal if the CLT is satisfied. So hopefully you remember that that's the central limit theorem. And it tells us that our sample must be large enough to balance out any chance variation. Well, how large is large enough? This one's even easier to check them with proportions. We simply have to see, was our sample size greater than or equal to 30? As long as we took at least 30 individuals in our sample, then we're in good shape. Now, this is not the only way that this could be met. Or, if our population happens to be known to be normal already, then that tells us that the sampling distribution will also be normal. Next up comes center, mu of x bar, the average sample mean. Well, similar to what we saw before, it's all about unbiased estimators and we need random sampling because this is telling us what sample proportion should we expect to see for a sample size n and provided that we do have a randomly selected sample from our population, it's going to equal the thing that we are trying to estimate in the first place. So if we have random sampling, then mu sub x bar will equal mu. The next thing is to look at the standard deviation, which tells us how much variation is expected from one sample to the next. Similar to proportions, we had a formula. This one is also a little bit easier, and it's sigma divided by the square root of n. Now, here we have to assume that we know something about the population already. We have to know the population standard deviation. So this is always going to be kind of estimated in real practice if we're trying to evaluate claims with it. But you're just going to kind of have to bear with me and bear with us through the problem solving process. And you'll see where it's going to be a little bit more realistic down the road. Now, similar to proportions, this is only true if we are sampling independently and without replacement. But since we usually aren't doing that, 
what we need to make sure is that the 10% condition is satisfied. So for spread, we can use this formula only if your sample is no more than 10% of your population. So pause here if you need to, but make sure all of these conditions are written down because we will refer to them when we check our conditions. So now that we have all those characteristics done, let's go and summarize the characteristics of the sampling distribution of X bar. So when we know that the shape is normal by checking the CLT, the central limit theorem, that the center the, is mu sub X bar and the spread is sigma sub X bar found with the following formula, then that means we can calculate how likely we are to get a sample with a given sample mean using norm CDF. Now, if we don't want to do that or in another pinch, let's say you don't have your graphing calculator to use norm CDF, you could use z-scores just like we did to determine if something is super weird. Now, as we know, anything super weird would be considered an outlier, and we check for outliers by comparing how many standard deviations above or below the mean a sample is. And this is exactly what the z-score is telling us. So as we remember, the z-score formula is x minus mu over sigma, and we translated that, we generalized it, to say that x is our observed value, mu is the mean, and sigma is the standard deviation. But in this case, the observed value is what we got in our sample, and that's x bar. The mean is the mean of the sampling distribution, not of the population, but the mean of the sampling distribution. And then the standard deviation, again, is not sigma of the population, it's sigma x bar. It's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And if this z-score calculation is neg less than negative 2 or more than positive 2, then we know that our sample mean is an outlier and should be considered very unusual. Now, let's go ahead and apply this to our burrito spot conundrum and evaluate a claim. So your favorite burrito spot boasts that it is the home of the one pound burrito or 16 ounces. You start to wonder, are their burritos really one pound? Now, after some investigating, the spot's quality assurance folks say their burritos weigh 16 ounces on average and have a standard deviation of one ounce. Over the course of the next two months, you visit the burrito spot 31 times on random days of the week and at random times of the day, ordering the one pound burrito each time and weighing each burrito before eating it. Your average burrito weighed 15 and a half ounces. And is this convincing evidence that the burrito spot is lying about their one pound burritos? So, follow the same kind of strategies that we would normally use. You want to make sure you're marking your text. So let's identify some things that we notice. First, there's a claim. The claim is that mu is 16 pounds. That's supposed to be true for all of their burritos. On average, they weigh 16 ounces. And the standard deviation is only one ounce. Now, this is supposed to be true for all of their burritos. So that's the population. But we don't know how many total burritos there are here. What we do know is that it's going to be likely a very large number. Now, the next pieces of information that we spotted were that there were 31 times you went to the burrito spot. So that means your sample size is 31 and your average over the course of all those visits was 15 and a half ounces. So that's your X bar. From here, we should be able to check our conditions. The first condition to check is the CLT. And we want to know, is our sample going to be at least 30? Well, in this case, indeed it was, it was 31. So we know that our sampling distribution should be approximately normal. Next thing we needed to check for was random sampling. Well, you did go to this burrito restaurant on random days of the week and at random times of the day, and you did it 31 times. So the random sample of N equaling 31 tells us that the mean of the sampling distribution is going to be the same as their claimed population mean, and that's 16 ounces. Now, the next thing to look for is the spread or the standard deviation. So we have to check the 10% condition. Now, this is where things can get a little bit tricky, but once you start to think about it for a moment, it makes a lot of sense. We don't know what capital N is, the population size, but we do know that it's representing all one pound burritos. Now, we just have to assume that it's a very, very large number. Specifically, I'm going to say that capital N must be much, much greater than 310. That's what the double greater than symbol means. That's not a typo. That just means much, much greater than. Well, if we took a random sample of 31 and we know that our sample must be no more than 10% of our population, then if we take 10 times our sample, 31, we get 310. As long as our population is bigger than that, the 10% condition is going to be satisfied. 
So now that we can see this, we can use the formula sigma sub x bar is equal to sigma over squared n, and we get 0 0.1796 for the standard deviation. And now we just have to look at what's our cutoff point? What's the observation that we have before we can use norm CDF? Well, we know that we got a sample mean of 15.5 ounces. That's somewhere left of what's claimed. It's less than the supposed mean of 16. So we want to look at not just that value, but anything that's more extreme than that. So anything less than that as well. So we're looking at anything that's less than 15.5 ounces on average. Now we've got everything we need for a norm CDF calculation. Our lower bound goes all the way to negative infinity, but you know you can't have a negative weighing burrito, so just go ahead and put your lower bound to zero. That's good enough. Your upper bound is 15.5, your mean is 16, and 0 0.1796, that's the standard deviation that we are going to use, because remember, this is all based off of the sampling distribution. Now, we get a probability then that the sample mean is less than 15.5 ounces is equal to 0 0.0027. Now this is pretty tiny. This is less than 1%. So what does that tell us? Well, if this is a less than 1% probability of getting this sample due to just random chance alone, then this is very surprising and I would doubt the burrito spots claim. And what does that tell me? I'm about to get some free burritos for life after I file this class action lawsuit. Now, let's say again, you don't have the norm CDF calculator on you. You can still look to see is this extremely unusual or not by looking at z-scores. So let's go ahead and do that. All the claims and the conditions and all the given information is the same. It's just your approach that's different if you want to use the z-score method. So to use z-score, we know that we are going to be looking at x-bar minus mu of x-bar divided by sigma of x-bar. And plugging in the values that we already have written down for this, we have 15.5 minus 16 divided by 0 0.1796 punching that into a calculator and we get negative 2.78. What does that tell us? That tells us that this sample of burritos with an average weight of 15.5 ounces is 2.78 standard deviations below what we would expect. That is so unusual it could be called an outlier and that makes us doubt the burrito spots claim. So Armed with all of this information, you can now start to evaluate claims based off of the characteristics of sampling distributions, and we can start to make inferences a little bit later on in much more sophisticated methods. So let's go ahead and recap everything that we have done today. In conclusion, we have met all of our objectives. We determined the characteristics of the distribution of the sampling distribution of X bar by looking at the CLT, Central Limit Theorem, to determine the shape. If we had random sampling, then we knew we had unbiased estimators, and we knew what the mean would be, and then the 10% condition would tell us about the standard deviation. We calculated probabilities of getting a certain X bar using norm CDF and Z scores, and then we also used that sample mean to evaluate a claim. Remember, we had to see, do we have a low probability? That should tell us to doubt the claim. If we have a not so low probability, then maybe we don't have strong enough evidence yet. And finally, we were also able to answer our essential question, how do we use sampling distributions of X-bar? Well, statisticians use the sampling distributions to determine if a claim should be doubted and investigated as fraudulent, like what we saw here with the burrito spot. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you in class. Catch you next time.